in the headlines. After much political wrangling, former ruling party floor leader Lee Wan Gu is confirmed as Korea's new prime minister. Chinese and Japanese investments in Korea more than doubled on year to an all-time high last year amid the Korean economy's sluggish growth and low prices. North Korea celebrates its late leader Kim Jong-il's 73rd birthday with lavish fireworks and festivities. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un visits Kun Susan Palace of the Sun to pay tribute to his father and grandfather. Hello and welcome to Arirang News. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Lee ji filling in for Kang Tae-ri. After much political wrangling, Korea finally has a new prime minister. Former ruling party floor leader Lee wan gu was confirmed at the National Assembly today. And as he takes on the new role as prime minister, he'll have a lot on his plate, including rebuilding his image, tainted by allegations of ethical lapses. Arirang News' Jim young gil has our top story. After four days of bipartisan wrangling, Lee wan gu was finally confirmed on Monday. Of the total 281 votes, 148 lawmakers have voted to confirm, 128 have voted against, and five votes are deemed invalid. The motion is passed. The new prime minister is expected to help push forward President Park Geun-hye's policy drives to help working people and revitalize the economy. With E's confirmation, the presidential office is expected to carry out a small reshuffle involving cabinet members and presidential aides, based on the new prime minister's recommendations. President Park's office will also be able to avoid questions about her vetting system and avoid a vacuum in state affairs. The vote was postponed once last week after the main opposition New Politics Lines for Democracy refused to endorse the nominee and demanded he step down. Even before Monday's vote began, it was unclear whether the main opposition party would participate, as some of the party's hardliners had called for a boycott. In Korea, the prime minister is the second highest position after that of president. But the job has been largely ceremonial as the power is heavily concentrated with the president. He has been the third prime minister nominee since May after the first two nominees withdrew over allegations of ethical and other lapses. Prior to his confirmation, E was facing numerous allegations over various ethical lapses, including real estate speculation, draft dodging, and allegations that he tried to stop the press from carrying negative reports about him. The nation will now have to wait and see what kind of influence the new prime minister can have over state affairs and what role he will play in assisting the president. Jim young Adirang News. Well, for the first time this year, President Park Geun-hye hosted a meeting with their Unification Preparatory Committee on Monday. There, the president and committee members talked about ways to secure international investments to cover some of the hefty costs of unification. Our Cheosan reports. President Park Geun-hye, who has said a unified Korea will offer a bonanza to the peninsula, says a unification roadmap should be drawn up to include benefits not only for the two Koreas, but the world. By attracting international attention to investment opportunities in a unified Korea, the president expects to offset anticipated unification costs. President Buck's envisioned blueprint would include overseas funding for social overhead capital and resources development in the north. At the same time, the president urged Pyongyang to take note of countries like Mongolia, Vietnam and Myanmar, which have carried out reforms and opened up their markets to the outside world. 북한은 이런 변화의 물결을 외면하지 말고 직시해서 하루속히 개혁과 대화의 길로 나서야 할 것입니다. With regards to Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions, President Park said Seoul and the international community should continue to persuade the North to change its course and explain how unification would benefit both Koreas. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. 
Meanwhile, over in North Korea, the regime celebrated its late leader Kim Jong-il's 73rd birthday today. The reports from Pyongyang depicted fireworks and festivities marking the day, while North Korean leader Kim Jong-un headed over to Kim Su-san Palace of the Sun to pay tribute to his father and grandfather. Our Hwang Sung-hee tells us more. Lavish firework displays color the skies of Pyongyang. It's part of the grand festivities commemorating the 73rd birthday of late former leader Kim Jong-il. Dubbed the Day of the Shining Star, it is one of the country's biggest holidays, along with the birthday of the nation's founder Kim Il-sung, known as the Day of the Sun. The event, broadcast via state media on Monday, shows Pyongyang residents watching the fireworks over the Taedonggang River. North Korea watchers say fireworks have become more common in Pyongyang since Kim Jong-un came into power. The young Kim visited Kim Su-san Palace of the Sun at midnight to pay tribute to his father and grandfather. He was accompanied by key military officials, including director of the Korean People's Army, Hwang byung sub but his wife Lee seol ju and sister Kim Yo-jung were absent from the crowd, just like last year. By visiting the Kim Su-san Palace with only key military officials, Kim Jong-un is trying to show that he has taken over the military while also upholding the country's military first policy and establishing one-man leadership. Despite earlier speculation about the potential for military provocations by North Korea to mark the Day of the Shining Star, no such signs have been detected. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Investors from China and Japan are becoming the key players in Korea's capital market that's suffering amid the country's sluggish growth and low prices. The combined net buying of Korean shares and bonds by the countries last year hit a high not seen since the 2009 global financial crisis. Here's our Kim Min-ji with more. Foreign capital, especially from China and Japan, is pouring into the Korean financial market. According to the Financial Supervisory Service, Chinese and Japanese investors bought a net 6.7 billion U.S. dollars worth of Korean shares and bonds last year. That's more than double from 2013 and an all-time high since the watchdog first began compiling such data in 2009. Experts say while other countries have been cautious when it comes to Korea, which has been suffering from slow growth and low prices, China and Japan have been aggressive in tapping into the market. Last year, Japanese investors bought a net $2.8 billion worth of shares on the Seoul Bourse, while Chinese investors bought a net $1.8 billion in shares. Combined, it's a significant number considering that the total net purchases made by foreigners came to $5.7 billion. On the bond market, Chinese investors bought a net $2 billion in bonds last year, becoming the largest investor. In terms of bond holdings, China ranks second, trailing behind the United States. Experts say the inflow of capital from the two neighboring nations can be attributed to China's rapid economic growth and Japan's quantitative easing programs. Kim min Arirang News. Well, major economies around the world are continuing to loosen their monetary policies, which analysts believe could lead to what they call an unspoken currency war. And back here in Korea, all eyes are now on whether or not the country's central bank will follow its global counterparts. Our Hwang Jae has the details. So far this year, 17 countries and the European Central Bank have eased their monetary policies either by lowering their key interest rates or introducing quantitative easing programs. Canada, Switzerland and 11 emerging economies like India and China are in this race, which comes as the countries try to prop up their ailing domestic economies. Now pressure for further monetary easing by Korea's central bank is piling up. 
But analysts say it's unlikely the central bank will take action on Tuesday. This month's monetary policy meeting is taking place right before the Lunar New Year holiday, and the central bank has not signaled a rate cut, so we'll keep the rate unchanged for this month. Korea's finance minister Che kyung hwan also emphasized last week that it's more important to push through structural reforms than to debate over a rate cut. Still, analysts expect a rate cut to take place sometime in the second quarter this year. The Korean economy is not showing signs of momentum for a solid recovery so far this year, just like in the fourth quarter of last year. To give a much-needed boost to the economy, the central bank is expected to cut the rate in April or May before the U.S. Federal Reserve starts to raise its key interest rate. Korea's low inflation rate is also giving the central bank room to trim its key interest rate. Consumer prices were running below the BOK's 2.5 to 3.5 percent inflation target ban for more than two years in January. Some analysts say, however, that the central bank will not join the global move toward monetary easing, as there's no clear sign of it affecting the local financial market. Hwang Jie, Adang News. There's a wind of change blowing through the global auto industry. Many of the world's leading automakers are pulling factory operations out of emerging markets and putting them back in their home countries. Our Song ji reports. The days of automakers busily building new plants in emerging markets may soon be over, with demand slowing in those nations and the growing need to create more homegrown jobs in their own nations. The Korea Automotive Research Institute says auto demand in the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India and China, is expected to sag this year, especially when compared to recovery seen in developed markets like the U.S. and Europe. The Russian market is slumping at the fastest rate. It's projected to shrink 29 percent this year, marking negative growth for the third consecutive year. China, the world's largest auto market, still boasts annual demand of 20 million units, up 8 percent from last year, but that's slower than last year's 11 percent expansion. With emerging markets slowing, some leading automakers are going back to their roots. Ford, for example, relocated its Mexican truck factory to Ohio last year, following the U.S. government's decision to give auto firms incentives for creating new jobs in the United States. Japanese automaker Nissan also announced it was bringing operations at its rogue factory in the U.S. state of Tennessee back to Japan. That said, Korean automakers Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors are still expanding their production output overseas. Domestic demand in Korea is limited and they're looking to catch up with global automakers in terms of annual production units. Song ji Arirang News. People tend to think negatively about the rapid aging of Korea's population, and there's certainly reason for worry given the financial challenges it's likely to pose in the future. But for some, it's an opportunity for business. Editing News' Connie Kim takes a closer look, closer look on this week's Industry Insight. Come 2026, about a quarter of the nation's total population will be 65 or older. Now zeroing in on this lucrative market, Korea's medical machinery industry is targeting the silver generation. The domestic medical device industry has been growing about 5 percent annually over the past six years, topping 4.2 billion U.S. dollars in 2013. And it'll only increase as demand rises with the changing senior demographic. But it's not a surge in cutting-edge operating room hardware that's leading the way. Looking at the most recent data, the top manufactured devices were dental implants devices and dental alloys used in fillings. About 9 out of 10 seniors in Korea are implant recipients. The country's leading dental x-ray manufacturer, Vatek, is just one of the many companies that see the potential for this market and is aiming to cash in. It's important to use accurate dental x-rays, especially for seniors, considering that implant surgery comes with high risk. We expect a surge in demand for our x-ray machines. And another fact, one in five seniors are known to be suffering from diabetes. 
Green Cross MS, a company that specializes in diagnostic tools, recently acquired a blood glucose monitor maker. The company says it's a landmark deal that'll help it focus more on developing technology for the elderly. This will help us access the ubiquitous healthcare market. We are currently doing research on how a smartphone could be used to track heart rates, cholesterol, and hemoglobin levels. Medical devices are evolving, going smart and high tech. Analysts forecast the industry will continue to head towards helping older generations. Medical machines have gotten smaller, small enough for elders to carry around. If the technology to send data from these medical machines to hospitals are developed, a new ubiquitous healthcare industry will open up. Korea's changing demographics are affecting how the local market will expand. In the past, medical advancements and devices squarely focused on curing people and saving lives. But now, the landscape of the industry is shifting towards helping people live healthier and longer. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Egypt's military says it's bombed several Islamic State targets in Libya. This after the release of a video appearing to show the brutal execution of a group of Egyptian hostages. For more, we turn to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, this horrific video emerged on Sunday, and it appears that Cairo isn't wasting any time to respond to this. That's right. The Egyptian government is making it clear that it is taking revenge for the murder of their countrymen. That video released by militants allied to the Islamic State group purportedly shows the mass beheading of 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians. And in the latest announcement, Egypt's foreign ministry said tough intervention against this terrorist organization is needed, describing them as a threat to international security. Our Connelly has more. Egypt is striking back. Its military said on state radio Monday that its warplanes have bombed militants in Libya affiliated with the group calling itself Islamic State. This just hours after Egypt's president vowed revenge for a video appearing to show the mass beheading of 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians by the IS terrorists. Egypt reserves the right of retaliation and with the methods and timing it sees fit for retribution from those murderers and criminals who are without the slightest humanity. Egypt's military said its planes had targeted weapon reserves and IS training camps in Libya. The horrifying five-minute video released Sunday shows the victims, all male and wearing orange jumpsuits, being marched along a beach before being simultaneously beheaded by terrorists in black masks. The video is called a message signed with blood to the nation of the cross. And as the killings take place in Libya, it's raising concern that the militant group is expanding and has an affiliate outside of the group's core territory of Iraq and Syria. The U.S. has also condemned the terrorists for the killing of innocents, saying it is just the most recent of the many vicious acts they've committed. The victims who were working in Libya were kidnapped by the terrorist group two months ago and have ignited demonstrations in Egypt with protesters urging the government to take action. Thousands of Egyptians are said to have gone to Libya in search of work since the Arab Revolution there in 2011. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And in the latest update on the deadly shooting in Copenhagen over the weekend, police in Denmark believe the assailant was a 22-year-old Danish national. Paul, this young man is reported to have had a history of violent crime. What else are authorities saying and what other information do we have on this lone gunman? Well, local media there have named the suspect Omar Al Hussein. Officials are now trying to confirm if he had any ties to extremist groups. As the targets of this killing spree suggest it may have been religiously or ideologically motivated. This as police have now charged two other men with helping Omar Al Hussein to carry out the attacks. Our Son Jong-in reports. Police in Denmark are focusing their investigation on the gunman's movements before, during and after the deadly twin shootings that ended on Sunday when he was shot dead by police. Danish intelligence agency chief says the suspect, a 22-year-old man born in Denmark, was on their watch list prior to the attack. It's a person who was known to us, so yes, it was a person on intelligence's radar. 
Withholding his name, authorities said the attacker was known to the police for several criminal offenses, including violence, gang-related activities, and possession of weapons. After assessing CCTV footage, police believe the man acted alone, but they are still trying to see if the suspect received assistance from others. The gunman opened fire at an arts cafe that was hosting a debate on freedom of speech on Saturday afternoon. Among those in attendance was Swedish cartoonist Lars Vilks, who has received death threats in 2007 when his depiction of the Prophet Muhammad as a dog was published. The suspect was shot dead early on Sunday after a second attack at a synagogue. The carnage killed two civilians and injured five police officers. The Danish prime minister says the shooting was a politically motivated terrorist attack and she promised to protect freedom of speech and the Jewish community in the country. The incident brings up memories of the recent terror attack in Paris. The French ambassador to Denmark, who attended Saturday's debate, believes the motivation for the cafe shooting was the same as for the shooting at the French weekly Charlie Hebdo that left 12 people dead. Son Jong-in, Arirang News. Well, shifting our focus to the crisis in Ukraine, reports of heavy fighting has jeopardized a fresh ceasefire in the east of the country. Now, Paul, this latest truce took effect less than 24 hours ago. And despite assurances from Russian President Vladimir Putin, it appears to be already falling apart. That's right. Both sides are blaming the other for breaking what was supposed to be a long-term ceasefire in Ukraine's eastern war-torn region. That deal, of course, was brokered last week in Minsk between the leaders of Germany, France, Ukraine and Russia. The foreign ministry in Kiev said Monday that its armed forces have been under fire from separatists over 100 times in just the last 24 hours. Despite the diplomatic breakthrough by world leaders, Ukrainian lawmaker Hanna Hopko says her country needs the support of its international allies to keep the peace. Of course, we do not have illusion and we are not too naive because after signing the Minsk in September, we saw how many people, among them children and civilians, were killed. So this is why it's important for Ukraine now to accumulate and to generate international support to get defensive weapons to protect our territories. Meanwhile, pro-Russian rebels in the eastern city of Donetsk say the ceasefire was first violated by Ukrainian special forces. Rebel leaders there have threatened to annul all current peace agreements if the government attempts to join what they called any anti-Russian alliance. Well, we hear that Japan's economy has managed to pull itself out of a recession. New government data shows a rebound in growth in the fourth quarter of last year. Paul, give us a breakdown of those figures. Well, the Japanese economy was able to turn things around by the end of 2014 after several disappointing quarters. However, analysts are taking the news as a small victory for the world's third largest economy. Official data released Monday showed the country's GDP expanded at a rate of 2.2 percent for the October to December period. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga said Tokyo's decision to postpone a second sales tax hike was behind the recovery. The economy grew at least 2.2 percent in the annualized rate, and I think it shows that the steps the government took were correct. Economists predict the current slump in oil prices will translate into a boost to consumer and capital spending, a trend that will likely help Japan continue to grow through the first quarter of this year. Jian? All right, Paul, thanks for those updates. We'll see you again in just about two hours. Hello and welcome, I'm Kim Bo-kyung with your weather outlook. We begin with news of snow and showers falling in most parts of the country. In fact, a heavy snowfall watch has been issued for parts of Gangwon-do province where over 20 centimeters of heavy snow is expected. And it seems like the rain will accompany the snow with 5 to 20 millimeters expected to fall over the Chungcheongbuk-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces. It seems like the snow and showers will gradually clear up by tomorrow afternoon with daytime highs forecast to peak from between 4 to 10 degrees which is slightly chillier than today. Looking ahead, the good news is that uh, mild winter conditions will continue through the Lunar New Year holiday. On to Tuesday's ratings. Seoul tops out at 6, Daegu 7, Busan reaches 10. Meanwhile, Jeju tops out at 9, Dokdo 6, Mount Kumgang minus 4. That's all the updates I have for you now, but I'll be back with more after 10. See you then. 
All right, that does it for now, but I'll be back at 10 p.m. Korea time with the latest updates. Thanks for watching.